This episode is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Turn your ideas into reality with an Azure free account. Get everything you need to develop apps across cloud and hybrid environments, scale workloads, create cloud-connected mobile experiences, and so much more. Discover what you can create with popular services free for 12 months. Learn more at azure.com. That's A-Z-U-R-E dot com. And sign up for a free account to start building in the cloud today. Hi, I'm Adam Berkmans, and today we're making homemade lobster stock. This recipe was created by Justin Townsend, editor-in-chief of Harvesting Nature. He writes, I'm a huge proponent of using as much of the animal as possible. Many folks disregard the head, legs, and other parts of the lobster when cleaning. In Florida, I've seen more people rip the tail off of the lobster and toss the head back in the water. Not only do they mess some of the meat inside the head, but they also toss out a great resource for making stock. My lobster cleaning method is slightly different and involves splitting the lobster down the middle of the head and then cutting away the tail meat. I discard the stomach sac because it imparts some untasteful flavors in the stock. I clean out the anus of the lobster and then split the tail in half as well. The head is full of some great flavor which is captured in the stock recipe below. You can use the lobster stock for preparing rice, making soups, and so much more. Thanks Justin. Lobster as a food stuff has had an interesting history in North America. Pretty much anyone with a passing interest in food history or a penchant for imparting random factoids will be happy to tell you that lobsters were once so detested that they were only fed to prisoners. The prisoners eventually became so fed up with eating the crustaceans that they rioted and demanded laws be put in place to limit the amount of lobsters served to them. This is during colonial times. Now, that's a cool, juicy factoid, and one that I myself have passed on to disinterested listeners who are forced to be in the same room as me. Is it actually a fact, though? Thousands of online articles and threads would have you believe that it is a factual part of American history, some even going so far as saying that the lobster was ground up, shell and all, before being served to the prisoners. In my research for this episode, though, I dug deep enough to find a few scholars saying that there isn't actually any evidence pointing to the veracity of this claim. According to food historian Kathleen Curtin, prisoners enacting laws to limit how often they were fed lobster is nothing but a myth, and there isn't a shred of documentation of it actually happening anywhere at any point in time. Hmm, seems that, like many food myths, this one was started by someone a long time ago latched onto and repeated by countless buzzy online writers and garrulous know-it-alls. Since that was supposed to be the premise of this episode, I'm left scrambling for something else to talk about. Luckily, the history of lobster is still just as rich and as sweet as this butter-drenched meat. Let's put on a plastic bib, crack it open, and take a look. First of all, I'll be talking mostly about the Atlantic lobster, although spiny and rock lobsters do play a part in this as well. The history of eating lobster goes back well before the first American prison, which happened to be a Spanish prison built in St. Augustine, Florida in 1570. Humans have been eating lobsters since prehistory, as evidenced by large piles of lobster shells forming middens around ancient habitations. These lobster middens have been found around the world, primarily in South Africa, Australia, Papua New Guinea, coastal Europe, Great Britain, and North America's Atlantic coast. The Romans enjoyed lobster and considered it a mid-level delicacy, meaning that it was eaten regularly by the rich and as a special treat by what passed as the middle class at the time. The Vikings also liked lobster and helped spread it around much of Europe as they raided and settled the coasts and riverlands. Due to its perishability, those living inland could only afford it if they were quite well off, whereas coastal dwellers likely purchased it it for modest prices. The first occasion of lobster being found in a cookbook was in the 1300s in Le Viendier de Talevant, considered to be one of the very first haute cuisine cookbooks. This meant that nobles and the aristocracy likely considered lobster to be a delicacy, showing that throughout history this food waxed and waned in popularity several times. This continued on for several years, with the inland wealthy enjoying cold lobster dipped in vinegar, and the coastal peasantry boiling it and depending on it for nutrition. 
Those who lived inland and were too poor to purchase fresh lobster either didn't get to eat it at all, and may not even have been much aware of it as a food, or only got to try it dried and salted, which by all accounts was quite nasty and barely edible. By the 1700s, both fishing and food transportation technology had developed enough to reliably procure more seafood and to get it to inland communities faster. At the same time, the church was banning the consumption of meat on holy days, so seafood became increasingly popular. People in Europe were enjoying lobster more and more. The same can't be said for across the Atlantic, though. The Plymouth Pilgrims spoke about lobsters in unbelievable abundance, and recounted being able to wade out and catch as many as needed by hand. Storms would wash up lobsters by the hundreds, creating a stinky mess. These lobsters were also much larger than we tend to see today, with anything under 5 pounds being considered small and often thrown back in. This abundance led to the lobster being seen as a survival food and nothing special, though it was eaten regularly. Colonists write about local indigenous people often catching and enjoying eating lobster as well, and they often use it as bait. To cook them, indigenous peoples would dig a hole in the beach, load it with hot rocks, stack on some lobsters, and cover them in fresh seaweed. This type of cooking inspired the New England clam bake, which is still very popular in the region. Excess lobsters were even fed to pigs when other food was scarce, which leads me to wonder how lobster finished pork would taste. Hmm, I wouldn't want to see the price per pound though. The washed up and beached lobsters would be used for fertilizer and as the colony expanded, salted lobster would be put up in jars to be shipped. To do this, lobsters would be cooked in large vats, picked from their shells, salted, and packed into jars which would be heated to seal. This canned lobster was apparently horrid and developed a reputation for, quote, green in the sea, red in the pot, and black in the can. Yum. Another issue was that at the time, lobsters were collected, killed, set aside, and eventually cooked. When lobsters die, their stomachs release enzymes into the rest of their body, which increases deterioration, causing it to go bad very quickly. This could be another reason why people tended to push it off onto the lower classes, as it probably tasted half-rotted. Cooks nowadays know that a lobster should be cooked very freshly killed, or even put into a frozen stupor and cooked alive for the lobster to taste its best. Although coastal communities continued to eat fresh lobster, it had lost any of its haute cuisine elegance. The crustacean was so overly available that it became the food of the servant class, where the rich would likely be enjoying imported goods from Europe. Canned lobster was served in some prisons, as well as to soldiers and indentured servants, though, as I said before, laws being created to cap the amount of lobster being served seems to be nothing but fiction. By the 1700s, a more reliable and efficient way of transporting lobsters was invented. Boats called smacks were built with tanks that allowed seawater to cycle in and out. This meant that lobsters could survive long transport and so began to be shipped far and wide. It also meant that lobsters could be shipped live instead of canned, creating a much better and safer product. Around this time, a three pound lobster costs about three cents at the market, and that's the equivalent of about $2.50 today. It wasn't until the 1800s that lobster began to be looked at once more as a fancy food. The reason? Trains. Train travel became very popular around this time, with many wealthy passengers exploring the country. Lobster at this time was still very plentiful and easily caught, especially with the recent innovation of lobster traps. It was sold to train companies to be served to their wealthy customers, who mostly came from inland locations where fresh lobster was barely known and had no negative connotations. The wealthy passengers loved this new special treat and wanted more of it, once more pushing the lobster back from peasant food to au cuisine. Once rich people were waxing poetic about lobster, the middle class suddenly needed it in their lives. People in New York and Boston began demanding more and more lobster, which inspired restaurant dishes and recipes and articles in newspapers. This is around the time that chefs figured out that they should be cooking their lobsters alive for a superior product. With better tasting lobster and even better shipping technologies like refrigerated train cars and containers, the lobster was able to make its way for far inland to clamoring gourmands. With increasingly efficient methods of capturing and shipping lobsters as well as overseas demand, the lobsters became harder and harder to find at the source. 
No longer were people hiking up their pants and wading into the ocean to scoop up 10-pound lobsters by hand. Lobsters were getting smaller and more expensive. Some experiments were made to farm lobsters, but they all failed due to the lobsters' inability to live in close contact with each other without fighting. Eating lobster had another boost when World Wars 1 and 2 came around. It was one of the few foods not rationed by the government and so could be enjoyed in excess, guilt-free. Eventually, Atlantic lobster became so expensive that it was once more fit only for the very wealthy or perhaps a special treat for a moderately wealthy person. There was still huge demand for them though, and some enter enterprising individuals began shipping the much cheaper spiny lobster from the Caribbean. This lobster is seen to be inferior with less meat, but people were just happy to say that they got to eat lobster. Restaurants like Red Lobster opened up, serving spiny lobsters under the barely concealed guise of Atlantic lobster, and the lower economic class could once again eat the food that at times was a burden and other times was unattainable to them. Lobster is still a hot commodity today and still enjoys its haute cuisine allure. Maine, the largest lobster fishery in America, harvests more than 130 million pounds of it each year. Much of this is shipped overseas, although you can still find lobsters sold in tanks and grocery stores, being served in fancy restaurants, and in delicious rolls in shacks dotting the upper east coast of the Atlantic. If you decide that you want to shell out for some lobster, or if you have access to your own wild lobster, be it Atlantic or Spiny, I suggest you use the shells and discarded pieces for Justin's homemade lobster stock. You won't regret it. This recipe makes 10 cups of stock and takes about one hour to make. You can make it with any type of lobster or crab. Ingredients. Five uncooked lobsters with tail, claw, and stomach sack removed. You can add in the empty shells from the tail and claw. One tablespoon of oil. Five celery stalks chopped. Half an onion quartered. Two carrots chopped. Five garlic cloves smashed. Four sprigs of thyme. Two bay leaves. One lemon halved plus juice. One teaspoon salt. Half a teaspoon of black peppercorns. And 1.5 gallons of water. How to make it. Pre Preheat a large stock pot over medium high heat. Add the oil, celery, carrots, onion, and garlic. Saute for three to five minutes. Add the lobster shells, bay leaves, thyme, salt, and black peppercorns. Carefully pour in the water and add the lemon juice. Bring the mixture to a simmer and allow it to cook for 50 minutes. Remove from the heat and allow the lobster stock to cool. Once cooled, discard the shells and the larger chunks of ingredients. Pour the stock over a strainer to remove any small chunks. Use a finer strainer to remove any of the tiny chunks. Optional, you can also pass the stock through a cheesecloth or paper filter before adding to jars. You want your stock to be as clear as possible. Divide the stock into glass jars. Be sure to leave room at the top for expansion in the freezer. Shelf life in the freezer should be around six months or so. Enjoy. For more great wild fish and game recipes, be sure to subscribe and follow Harvesting Nature's Wild Fish and Game Podcast.